Hello. Good morning. Good morning. We'll just get everyone in here. Morning, Dana. Morning, Todd. I'm so excited to see you. Of course, I saw your name and I was like, I got to go see Dana Watts. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same. Hi, Dana. Well, Hello, how are you? Good. I have to admit, this is my first PD event where I'm running it totally solo on my own because everyone else is running something else right now. I was like, you guys left me high and dry. <laughs> we got a lot of support here. How are you, Sharon? Great. Yeah, you know, Patricia just joined us in Chile. Oh, how exciting. I, I forgot know. about that. Yeah, it's so great. <laughs> Amazing. Your hair looks great. Ugh, thank you. It. It's getting grayer and grayer with three teenagers. We are supposed to have about um, 60 something people signed up for the event. So I'm just going to give people a few more minutes. We have 18 so far. Um, um, so I will just give them one more minute to um, get signed in and everything else. Find the link. I know um, personally I had three different links. So I want to make sure everyone's in the right spot. But in the meantime, feel free to introduce yourself on the side. got people from all over. Guyana, Ecuador, Georgia, Trinidad, Chile, Dominican Republic, Brazil, Guatemala, Brasilia, Cato. Oh, Susan, my good friends, I think are going there next year, the Krems. I think, yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. They're amazing people and Gigi happens to be their daughter is a is best friends with my daughter I love that family wonderful welcome everyone yeah we're excited to have Kevin and Ann join us it'll be fun oh so much that, that would be awesome yeah I was trying to steal them and get them to come here because I wanted, I basically was totally self-serving. I wanted their daughter to go to high school with my daughter. <laughs> and they're amazing people. <laughs> well, Dana, we can talk and maybe find a place for you to uh, go to Paxi. <laughs> we can chat later. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm going to share my screen and see. Um, let's make sure that this all works appropriately. Are you currently seeing on um, the screen for virtual learning? Thumbs up. I to go out okay. to the, I'm sorry, because they have chocolate in here that you might get. No, it's okay. I just want to get the chocolate and be sick. I'm going to mute you for now and we'll go through and then we'll have, um, I'll unmute you so we can chat more later. Um, so welcome everyone and welcome to this um, quick little overview on just some lessons learned um, through virtual learning this year through um, the work I've done through I with ISS and um, my colleagues there and some of the things that we've learned to just try to help you as you work with students and your colleagues within your own organizations. And I'm Dana Watts. Um, I'm the Director of Research and Development at ISS. Um, prior to working with ISS, I've been with ISS for about um, 18 months. And prior to ISS, I was in Thailand and India and Hong Kong with many people who are also on this call right now. And all of those people have helped me learn and grow as we've moved forward um, in, in 
throughout my years as an educator. And so um, I'm going to share with you a few of the lessons that we that I've learned, and we'll move forward from there. If you happen to be um, uh, unmuted, can you please make sure you mute yourself as we move forward? And here we go. Yep. So one of the first things that when you're looking at putting together any sort of virtual learning event is to really um, adhere to some norms for the group as a whole and how you're going to work and establishing those right from the start. And also looking at rules for engagement so people know from the start how they'll be able to engage. So for example, muting everyone from the beginning or things of that nature. So what I did is, um, doop, is so here's a few examples. What I did is just a, a few examples of some of the norms that we've used um, at ISS um, in some of our virtual learning events. So one was to establish norms for collaboration. So to make sure that people understand how they're going to collaborate and what they're going to do. So for example, um, I used to tell people to try to think about the seven norms for collaboration. I believe these are out of adaptive schools and to think about those things and to take those seven norms and think about using one of those and really thinking about that throughout their time within the session. So for example, um, presuming positive intentions. So if you're going to have a virtual event, especially about something that might be quite controversial or something that can be testy, um, to ask everyone to presume positive intentions and assume that everyone's there with the best, um, are there with the best you know, reasons to advocate for their students or to advocate for their team or something like that. Um, another set of norms that are helpful to use would be um, rules of engagement. So to make sure that people know how to engage. So I try to make sure that people understand, and this is really helpful with students. I don't know about any of you. I've got kids who are 16, 19, and 20. Yesterday I walk in on my daughter in her bedroom and you know she's in a breakout room. Well, all the kids have their videos off and they're all just not talking to each other. And they're like, well, our teacher won't know if we're not talking to each other. I'm like, well, then that's really boring school. And it's really boring learning. Like how are, if you're all, what, you think you're like getting away with something? So like, um, I, I told her, I said, well, if you take your video off, I guarantee that the other two will take their video off. And then you can start to actually talk to each other and take yourself off mute. But so I'm um, reminding people that the more they put into it, the more they get out of it and kind of establishing something like that right from the start. Um, also reminding people to be present and limiting their distractions. Sometimes that's with, you know, a chat of some sort, helping them come together. A lot of people are really good with doing mindfulness. Reminding people that if you're going to have a long session, um, the sessions that I ran this summer, some of them were four hours long. Four hour long Zoom is a very long Zoom. So I'd make sure that they knew that we were going to have restroom breaks, that we understood if they needed to turn off their camera and walk away. If they wanted to eat or drink, totally welcome. If they needed, you know, whatever they need to do, we understood. Um, we also tried to make sure that people always knew how to name themselves in Zoom. Um, and sometimes that mattered, um, you know, one thing is their name, but sometimes I would have them rename themselves with their location first, or I would have them rename themselves with what division of the school they worked in, or what it was they wanted to speak about. Teaching them how to do that also helped them then when they were in, um, so if I was teaching teachers that, then they could then share that with their own students or share that with parents or share that with bigger community groups when they were working with them. Um, I also always encourage people to pose questions in the chat because chances are if someone is confused, there are more than one people within the group that are, that are confused. And so I always encourage people to use the chat and I normally would put up a screenshot to show them where um, how to have the chat going and to watch a video, you know, watch a screen at the same time. I always ask people to mute their mic and then you'll see down here in the corner and see this in a bunch of these. I always provided them a link back to my original presentation. So I always create a small bit.ly link, which are totally free. 
and I create a small bit.ly link with something that's easy for them to remember. So this was an ISS workshop on early years. So chances are, that, but I reminded them on every single slide how to get back to the presentation. So they could, so if they lost focus or they were like, oh, I want, I, I wish I had a screenshot of that or whatever, they actually had copies of all the different slides. And recently, I've been working a lot with the Diversity Collaborative, and these are some norms that I found that I thought were incredible, um, and they were not created by me. Um, Nadine Richards created these, but I thought these were really um, strong norms that I just wanted to share as well, as far as um, ways that we can speak and talk to each other. And um, this was one for a um, when we were talking about you know um, diversity, equity, and inclusion and justice within international schools, and Nadine created these, and I thought they were quite strong. So I wanted to show an example of these as well. Um, making sure every voice is valued is one of the ones that I think is the most important. Often when we break into discussion groups or even when we come into a whole group discussion, I find often same voices are tend to dominate the conversations. In virtual learning, one of the most, um, I think, best things that have come out of it is the use of the chat. So let's say that you're, you've got students from, from all different languages. It gives them time to process and to think about and formulate what they want to say and have an equal voice in a conversation. It also helps them not have to put themselves out there. I know I participate in um, AAIE conversations quite often, and when I first started, I was terrified. I haven't been a head of school to sit there and be with a bunch of heads of school and people who I have interviewed with all over the world. It's a little bit intimidating. And in some of those circumstances, it's also intimidating when I might be one of the only females in the group. It's hard for me to figure out how do I bust in and say something, and does anyone really care what I have to say? Using the chat, is a great way to help um, establish equity amongst all the different participants. And then if you see someone who's participating a lot in the chat, then you can say, oh, hey, I noticed that such and such has a bunch to say. Do you want to chime in here? Or, you know, in a minute, I'd like to see if anyone in the chat would like to speak up. If you do, raise your hand and trying to find ways that people can be more included within a virtual um, group. Okay, my second tip is to create one stop shopping. So um, what I like to do is create one location for everybody so they can find the links to everything we're going to do in a virtual learning event. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that. So I always first give them a quick, so like I said, I create, a, I like Google Docs, even though um, I know I'm supposed to be playing in a Microsoft Word um, situation more and more lately. I like, I'm still a fan of docs. It's easier. I've used it. Every time I run a virtual event, I also create it in a doc and we've been able to use it. A lot of our schools are located in China and we haven't had any problems as long as I keep everything open and that anyone can view it. Um, and, but I try to create one document. So there's one stop shopping for everyone. I make sure that they see that this link the bit.ly link is on every slide, like I mentioned, and then I give them a picture so they know when they click on it, have they actually gotten to the right page with all the links that we're going to use throughout the entire virtual learning event. Then what I do is on the top of it, again, I, I, so this is one from when we did one on English language arts. I made sure that they knew the names of everyone who was presenting so that they can go and reconnect with those people again. And in our events this summer, I, I know like we're all inundated with email and I don't know about you guys, but there are days when I open up my email at you know, five or six o'clock in the morning and there's something like 150, 200 overnight. And I'm like, good God, that's not really, so I don't always like to necessarily share my email. I would prefer because it's already inundated, but on Twitter is a great way to connect professionally. So I always try to make sure, especially if we're connecting with educators and different people in a virtual learning event who are not all in the same organization, sharing their Twitter accounts I think is a great way to be able to help people to connect. And the Twitter accounts don't change when they go from learning event to a learning event in school to school, organization to organization. I also try to make sure that I share 
a bunch of hashtags that might have something to do with what we're talking about. So if they want to continue to learn after that event, there are ways that they can continue to follow and engage in conversations that will help continue their virtual learning. Then underneath there, I try, so first of all, I'm a color person. I like things to be super organized. I kind of might have some issues, but I try to also make sure I put things into blocks. So again, this was a four hour um, event, but I wanted people to see they're in, they're organized. And so first when we did our introductions and welcome, here was a copy of everything and it was in blue. So then all my slides were in blue, all the links were in blue, everything that they needed was there and they could click on any one of those things and go straight to those resources. Then when we worked on, we worked on a section on approaches to online learning and pedagogy. Then again, here was a link to the video in case they wanted to show it that I used in the presentation in case they wanted to show it and use it with their own students. And then there were links to all the different breakout groups. So they always had access to it because when you get sent into those breakout group rooms, everyone's like, oh, oh, where's the link? What was I supposed to do? Who, where was I supposed to be going? So again, just trying to create a really visual one-stop shopping for everyone to go to, whether it's students, whether it's adults, whether it's teachers, the more visual you can be and have everything centrally located is really helpful. Um, I'm currently running a bunch of courses uh, or we're doing additional professional learning through ISS and I'm running them all through Canvas because I know now that I want one place for everyone. That's where the webinars are. That's where the calendar is. That's where the discussion boards are. I can't. And so having the one stop um, shopping is very helpful. Um, next, um, I think it's really important to be flexible and honest because no matter how much you plan in a virtual learning environment, anything can go wrong and you never know and so it's just really helpful to tell people like if you're nervous and you're trying something new own it if you um if something doesn't work you know don't try to pretend like it all went great say oops okay screwed up that that one and go forward our biggest screw up was trying to run we ran one professional learning event where we thought everyone had probably updated their zoom and we thought that people could then go into their own breakout group rooms and and put them place them in it. That did not work at all. And so when we sent everyone, we said, okay, everyone go to breakout group room. I think we had 300 people on the call and 270 stayed behind because they didn't know how to do it. And so then we're mass trying to put people in rooms. And what we should have done is said, pause. That was a that did not work. Let's come back and we're just gonna put you into random rooms. You know, um, or what you can do is easily, like now what lesson learned is I will send people reminders and say, if you haven't updated your Zoom, please do so. In the Zoom call, we will do um, breakout group rooms. So if you don't feel like participating, this may not be the right webinar for you. Um, and I'll send you a recording after. Or, you know, I'll tell people, um, oh, you're going to um, be expected to, um, um, speak about this or make sure you have a chance to review this, like making sure that people know some of that. But if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And then pull people back and 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 say, okay, sorry, let's reiterate and or let's re um come together and try to move into a new idea. But it's okay to say that it didn't work. And I've had to do it one one breakout a uh, one session that we ran, I think we had close to a thousand people. And when we tried to run something, it didn't work. And it's embarrassing to tell a thousand people that, oh, that didn't work. But we're all kind of learning together. And general, and actually what happened is somebody on the side in the chat showed us a better way to do it. And we were able to fix the situation. Um, another idea is to prototype and iterate. Constantly experiment with new things. And try each time, I would say, try something new whenever you're running a virtual learning event even with when it's with strangers and people that you may not know so well the more you try to experiment and try new things the stronger your practice becomes but then also to constantly revise and and each time you run something like i've run this workshop before as a 30-minute workshop 
Um, but I spent probably four hours this morning re rewriting it and working on it again because I was like, oh, I didn't like that when I did that the last time. Um, and then to ask people for feedback in the end. Um, one thing that we try to do all the time is ask people um, what worked, what didn't work, what was your favorite thing, what was your least favorite thing. So an example would be when we first ran a session this summer on um, we did a deep dive into science and we asked people at one point to talk about, you know, oh, let's talk about grading and reporting and we're going to talk about what's working and what's not working and how it, how is that? Let's just talk, chat. So I made this super complicated system of putting everyone, of course, like the bit.ly is called broken systems. It was a broken system. Believe me, this was a big screw up on my part. So I because I was trying to over micromanage a discussion. So I sent all these people into rooms who could be from elementary, could be from middle school, could be from high school, and then send them into rooms and said, oh, let's talk about your grading and reporting practices. Well, I'm sorry, but nobody really, first of all, we don't have a lot of autonomy over our grading and reporting practices. That is a school-wide decision or a divisional decision. And so great, and if one person is in one school and they're sitting there saying, oh, well, I think this, and now I think this, so one thing I'm gonna make or change is this, and then why did I have to have, a, that doesn't have anything to do, if I'm teaching in Hong Kong and someone else is in India and someone else is in Thailand, none of our grading practices align, I'm great, if, like, and we didn't need to document all these things, and I made it super complicated. So I got torn apart when I asked for feedback on that piece. And then what happened is, so I totally made a new iteration and I said, instead we're gonna do a small fire. And if you've done the training with adaptive schools or, and well, and I think very highly of Kendall Zoller who I've done a bunch of training with, he always talks about small fires and the importance of the intimate conversations. So I just gave them a fire a picture of a fire and I told them oh warm up your hands pretend you're having a fire in a fire pit in your backyard or on the beach or a campfire and let's just talk because the conversation was far more important than me documenting what anyone thought or what anyone felt about that and then I just established okay so let's talk about where are you now and where would you like your school to be in the future what do you wish you could change but let's just, and we didn't need to make it public about what we liked and didn't like about our schools because that was, trying to document that could also put people in an unsafe space. So by listening to other people, it helped me figure out how to revamp our entire session and our time with teachers during that time period. Okay, so number five um, was providing structures. So my for within virtual learning, um, one of the biggest things that I found was um, by providing structures, it really helped um, so that th people knew what was going to happen. So for example, using um, the feature on Zoom where you can just do thumbs up or just asking people, especially if you can see everyone, is everyone good? Give me a thumbs up if you understand what we're talking about before we move into the next steps. Then I would know, okay, um, I've got a good, you know, group. I know we're ready to move on. Or if I saw, you know, eh, not certain or a lot of thumbs down, then I knew, okay, let's go back and reiterate that conversation. Also making sure that we had really clear protocols. In the beginning, all the ideas that I had in my head made total sense to me because, duh, I created them. But other people had no clue what I was talking about. And my mind kind of works a little wonky, as probably most people's. But so I thought I made total sense. And no, it didn't make sense to anybody else. And then we'd send them into rooms, and people were confused. And also complete um, repeating directions within the breakouts. So using, when I'd send people to breakouts, I realized I quickly had to send them messages and reiterate what was the thing I just told them to do because they're so busy trying to figure out, okay, what was it and writing it down that they might miss a step and then they go in the room and everyone's just staring at each other. And that's completely awkward. So an example would be, so I would clear, I would make it really clear each time I said, okay, here are the steps that you're going to do. First of all, you're going to go for 20 minutes. 
Okay, and then I tried to make sure that they knew exactly what they needed to do. And I realized after time, at first I'd just send them into rooms and I'd say, oh, go share. Well, and, and talk about this without even introducing each other. And so I started trying to figure out ways, different ways to have them introduce themselves. Something maybe a little, you know, it might have something to do with what we're talking about or not. Like share your favorite Netflix binge or your favorite film that you just watched or something. A way for them to introduce themselves. Then ask them to select, you know, maybe some, just one person had to be on a Google Doc. So then not everyone was trying to get on the same Google Doc. And maybe say, okay, that person who's going to be the recorder also can share their screen so you all know what's going to happen. Then tell them what they need to do and how and what they're going to do with that information. Um, here's another example where I would, again, um, tell them what they need to do, how they were going to do it, and then what they're going to do with the information, and then how much time. Then what I would do is this might be the slide. But then it's also the slide on, it's the first slide they see when they go into a breakout group room. And I copy and paste all of those directions directly into a message that goes to everyone within the breakout room. So bam, they see it and those expectations are clear. Then I send um, warnings. You have 10 minutes, you have five minutes, we'll reconvene in two. And then it brings them back because sometimes people are like, how much more time do we have? Or they quickly realize that someone has dominated the conversation. So it helps, you know, I might send a reminder. If everyone hasn't had a chance to speak yet, please make sure you hear all voices in the room before we come back and reconvene. Next, um, be authentic and build trust. Um, I feel like one of the things that I've learned the most over the past few years is the people who know the answers are generally in the room. And asking one another to, to find solutions is really helpful. In any of our, our rooms, the one person who's facilitating isn't normally the, the, the keeper of all knowledge. We've learned that with students, we've learned that with, with within our own faculty. So asking people to problem solve together for anything can be incredibly helpful. And I have an example of some ways that we've done that um, um, with ISS this year and, and with all the different groups that we've been working with. Uh, one of the things we've been working with with ISS is um, creating what we call ISS challenges where we pose problems and then everyone kind of problem solves together to try to figure those out and we do some design thinking to make that happen within communities. One of the things we're working on right now is how do we make our schools, um, how do we build community in um, blended international um, environments that everyone feels inclusive and diversity isn't this one-off thing where we just dress up in certain days or it's just we only are trying to diversify um, the English language arts curriculum but none of the other curriculums and so we're, we're pulling together a group of teachers to try to make that happen together because I know I don't have all the answers that's for certain but the other people in the room will as well. Um, in virtual learning, the building knowledge is really important for all, and we don't always understand who all's in the room. So with our events that we held this summer and throughout this fall, um, we've had to learn to recognize the diversity in experience and background. We could be working with teachers from schools, you know, who are well resourced to schools where they're the one and only person who has even who's even going to get PD that year. Um, one of the um, one of the one of the biggest things that comes to mind is we were doing a whole workshop on standards based grading and reporting with Ken O'Connor. And I realized that there we had to establish the just the differences in between formative and summative assessment and, and clarify those definitions before we can move forward. And so some people could literally who were in that group could run an entire session on formative and summative assessment and standards based grading and reporting and others we need to clarify what that even was um, so establishing a shared vocabulary and then preventing authentic choice 
those three things all help build knowledge for all. So I have a few examples of that as well. So when we first started doing stuff on virtual learning, we had to make sure people understood even just the difference in between synchronous and asynchronous and make sure that people knew what that was before we um, moved any further. And then, um, then here's an example of how we pro provided choice. So we wanted teachers to be able to have an opportunity to explore different types of assessment. And so it would be great if I gave them one assessment and told them to create, critique that, but what if that assessment meant nothing to them? What if it was something that was totally out of context? So in this example, what we did is we created, um, uh, I was working with PE teachers. So what I did is I found PE assessments from every kind of anything, from health to high school assessments, to middle school assessments, to badminton, to whatever, whatever, whatever. And then I gave them a choice. So they could go into, they went into different breakout group rooms. So for example, if they were to go to breakout group room 25, at one point I had up to 75 breakout rooms. It was a lot to handle. Um, but so let's say um, five of us went to breakout group um, room 25. So we go to breakout group room 25. And then I gave them, so they had this laundry list of all these different assessments. So if there were five of us in there, we could say, you know what, what kind of assessment do we most want to look at? What do, what do we have in common that we most want to teach and we want to look at? And so then they might say, okay, well, we want to look at, you know, um, here, I'm going to do the next ones closer. So here you can see I put the grade levels next to them. So we could say, you know, a bunch of us teach uh, grade five. And so let's look at, um, we can't do gymnastics at my school, so let's look at, oh, I don't know, uh, individual pursuits, self-assessment, or invasion games, okay, and a rubric. What does that look like? You know, and then they'd click on that and they could go. But being able to allow um, the breakout group rooms and students to have some autonomy and self-direction can really help a lot as well. And this one I learned the hard way. I wasn't giving any brain breaks to anybody. Um, and especially, oh, at one point I got ripped apart a couple ways by someone who said, I've been sitting here for an hour and a half. Can I please like go to the bathroom? And I was like, oh my God, I didn't think about that. And I didn't think about, I mean, I had established, I had put these little mini breaks in, but I realized that I needed more and we also just needed brain breaks. So um, what we did, so I would put in, this is like an ugly um, icon or whatever, but I would put one in to remind myself to do it. And I have an example of one of them. So um, let's hope this video works. Um, so I think in two minutes, we'll be able to finish that favorite song of ours. Mm -hmm. So are you ready? Let's smile, everybody. Let's smile, everybody. Okay. Those I'm gonna give extra So basically what happened there was we ended up telling everyone we were working with early years at that moment and we told them to sing their favorite circle song. And so one person started, then another person started, then another person started. And what I don't have in that clip is the 300 people who are all started doing Baby Shark all together. And it was hysterically funny and as such a nice little break to just take a brain break and to do something totally different. 
Um, some other favorite ones that we did was acting out, um, acting out a favorite outdoor activity. So at one point, um, people were like swimming and skiing and things like that. Um, one that Liz Duffy mentioned to us um, that she did in a yoga class was eye yoga, where you go up and down and sideways and circles. And after staring at a screen for so long, it was a great way to do that. Um, one was playing virtual tennis. So you just choose someone on the other side of the screen. So I would say, hey, Brad, you're my tennis partner. And then you'd sit there and try to like mimic each other and try to do it. Um, and then um, one was like, touch, take your right hand and touch your left, right hand, touch your left ear, then take your left hand and touch your nose. And then you had to switch. Like, and it gets, anyway, you can tell I'm not very coordinated, um, but then you're all sitting there making fun of, you know, having fun together. And you take your screen off and you kind of all do it together. Um, oh, and I don't know why those last two things are there. Sorry about that. Um, all right, and then interaction. So to me, interaction is key. And I actually had two polls set up to go right now, but that was in the other webinar that they accidentally sent me the wrong link to, so I don't have the poll set up. You have to set up your polls ahead of time. <laughs> and um, before you start a webinar, or they don't really work very well. Um, and um, using the chat waterfall, so you can ask people, oh, what's, um, you know, what's the best way you've interacted online in an online environment? So uh, um, let's actually try to do that right now. So in a chat waterfall, um, in the chat, can you post right now, what is um, the favorite way you've, you, um, you've interacted online? I think I might be the only person chatting. <laughs> oh, yay. Okay. Jamboard. Oh, I love Jamboard. Jeopardy games, polls, Nearpod. Ooh, mixer challenges. Funny hat session. Share drawings. Um, Pear Deck. Wonderful. Oh, share an object that's outside of your screen. Padlets are amazing. Polls, wonderful. And there are a multitude of different resources that you can use to try to make things as interactive as possible. Scavenger hunts are great. And scavenger hunts are really fun to do. Even uh, we did one at ISS over the holidays and um, we did like a scavenger hunt holiday bingo and they had to run around and find stuff in their house and my colleague Pauline who is in Amsterdam was running around and at one point had like half her her holiday decorations behind her and was in out of breath pulling stuff in and getting people involved and, and showing people and it kind of made that virtual like I had never been in her house. I've actually never even met her face to face. And I feel like I know so much about her and her family because she's running around with her computer trying to find stuff in her house that day. So different ways to do that are great. Um, another thing that is super helpful is ways to help people um, stay connected. If you're running a virtual event with people who aren't normally together, um, what um, one thing that I try to do is create what I call a PLN um, spreadsheet. So a professional learning network for people who want to continue to stay connected afterwards because you've all come together in a like activity over something that you care about. I try to create some sort of spreadsheet where it has, you know, you can put your name, you can say where you're located in case you need someone who's within that region because they might have specific resources for that. Then um, an email if they feel like sharing it, what they've taught, what their possible connection is, um, and then different ways they want to connect. And so being able to have something like that is really helpful as well. 
I also um, learned this trick that one nice thing to do is to tell everyone to give themselves at the end of a, a, any sort of virtual learning event, to give yourselves, um, unite the learning with giving each other a hug and giving yourselves a hug for all the time that you spent learning. And at the end of an event, if you tell everyone, oh, just give yourselves a virtual hug and everyone, you see everyone all of a sudden a screen of all these people giving themselves a hug. It, um, it just kind of unites everybody and thanks them for their time and generosity in the learning event. And one of the things that we work with different people all over the place, and you, if you've run virtual events, you know, or any sort of PD online or whenever you're teaching online, you can get really nervous ahead of time. And if you're asking other people, if you're asking other people to co-facilitate with you, if you're bringing in outside pre present, uh, presenters and things of that, you need to give them as much support as possible. So whenever we run anything at ISS, I normally have any of our facilitators show up 30 minutes ahead of time. So I can talk to them, I can goof around, I might admit to them, you know, maybe some things where I've messed up before, like I told them one time, the most embarrassing, my most embarrassing virtual event that I've ever had is I was online. It wasn't in a professional manner. I was in a study group, but it was a study group that's pretty serious. And it was for me, it was 10 o'clock at night. So I poured in a juice glass, a little bit of wine, and um, I realized that it dripped all down the side. And I had at the time a white desk and it was like a prefab desk. And I was certain I was going to put like this big wine stain on my desk. So in the middle of the thing, I literally took it and I licked it and I was so embarrassed. But I'll tell people that story before we go live to relax them. I'm like, I still lived through that event like it's okay like the world didn't fall apart how much can you really screw up you know and try to like calm them down relax a little bit and then I also always try to tell them how I'm going to support them so I did a virtual event this past weekend for um, the Princeton Education Foundation because I'm on the board and the, my colleagues who I'm on that board with aren't used to virtual events. So that morning, by nine o'clock in the morning, I had 54 messages, text messages on my phone because people were nervous. So I told them, listen, we're going to communicate online on a chat. So I created a group chat for us during the event. I'm like, I don't want us trying to figure out how to have that conversation when we're live. We'll do that here. And I explained to them what we we're going to do. I also, um, the person who was running the event was scared to control the slide deck. Some people, when they're running it, want total control of the slide deck. Other people are very happy to say, oh, um, you know, will you, will, will you switch the slide for me? Will you switch the slide for me? Because they want their notes in front of them or they're just too nervous. There's too many things for them to remember. So if you are one of the facilitators of that, at, find out where their comfort zone is. And the other big thing that I came up with was a visual cue. Um, I've made a fun little, uh, I've got a cute picture for this, but I didn't actually do that to my presenters when they had gone over time, but when they're really excited about something, they don't realize that they're talking too long and they might be talking over other people. So I always had, I always did this. I kind of like pretended like I was itching the side of my face to let them know that they had gone on too long. Cause I'm not gonna do this and I'm not gonna cut them off unless I really, really have to. But they, their chances are if you're asking other people to present, whether it's a student, whether it's a parent, whether it's another teacher, whether it's a principal, whomever, if they're really passionate about something, they don't realize that they haven't let anyone else enter the conversation. So giving them some sort of clue that they need to move on is really helpful. And now we do that with all our ISS events. Whenever we have a presenter, we give them a visual cue so they know that perhaps they might've gone too long to give them so that they know. And then the one of the biggest things I think in all virtual learning is to figure out how to distribute your resources and to share and to constantly share and share and share we're all in this together in every way, shape and form. 
And none of us actually have all the answers and if we can build upon knowledge. And so I know many of you are familiar with Padlet, but one of the things we use this summer, we use Padlet a lot this summer. And one way that we use it is so, for example, we ran a whole session on how are we going to do virtual learning with science and what does that look like? Well, I cannot pretend, no matter how much training I've done with Paul Anderson, I am A, not a science teacher, and B, I can't pretend to be the know-all, be-all of science. So we asked everyone to come in and to add resources onto a Padlet of what did they find, and we created all different types of different um, categories up on top that were, you know, whether they were grade-specific, subject-specific, or whatever. This one, you can see up in the top, there were 94 entries for that one. So it was the first Padlet that we did. 94 resources that continue to be able to be built upon and people can continue to add to long after the event that we all had together. When we had our specialist one, we had art, music, and PE, and then over on the side, we had assessment, we had feedback, we had all these other ones. This ended up with 113 resources, and people continued to add to it and add to it. And, you know, we ran this six months ago. Two months ago, people were still adding resources to this and using it. And then after that event, I shared all of these resources, they're not mine, they're not ISSs, they're the tribes, right? They're everybody who came together. So then I continued to share this with all of the local schools, even in our area here. And I was like, listen, if we, and my friends, one of my friends who's a, a PE teacher, my daughter's old um, softball coach from years and years ago, emailed me the other day and he's like, Dana, I, I am the worst music teacher ever online right now. I am, I'm ready to quit. And I was like, okay, here's a link to this, then here's a link to a Facebook group, and here's a link to this, and here's a link to this. But helping people continue to share and grow is super helpful. Another thing for those of you who aren't aware is um, like, this is an example of a chart that we just used in PD last week at this exact time. But we um, is to create a template that's shareable. And so if you're not sure how to do this, whenever we create something for, for ISS, first we'll create one and we'll send people into breakout group rooms. So I like I mentioned, I'm a huge fan of spreadsheets um, and Google. So I'll send people into different groups, make sure they know what they need to do on one side, and then they each have a sheet to work on. But I want them to use this with their own teams in the future because great that's great for one one PD event right but they might I might need them to make a copy of it so if you're not familiar with this you can go up to the URL of any Google Doc any Google presentation any Google spreadsheet any Google anything you go up to that URL you highlight the top of it and just at the end where it says edit change that word to copy it forces everyone else to make a copy of it and they get then a blank copy that they can use in their own schools and bring back to their teams and continue to do that exercise. So we did that with, um, we were looking at different types of assessment, we were looking at different types of pedagogy, we were looking at different grading and reporting practices. I wanted, we were looking at problems with engagement in online learning. I wanted all of the people who did those workshops to be able to take that exact same thing, the same protocol that we did as a group to be able to go back and use it with their team. And you can do that with students as well so then they have a clean copy of something. If you don't want them to all work in the same document, it helps as well. Um, okay, so that was kind of my overview of some of the things that we learned and things of that nature. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and all the little icons are going up and down. What I wanted to do was open it up to just Q&A. Um, this is, I, I try, I always feel like um, you learn by sharing what worked and also all your big failures and I'm totally an open book. So if you have any questions about virtual learning or anything that I can help you with, um, please feel free. It's, um, it's open game. And you should be able to unmute yourselves, I believe. Let me make sure. Okay, you can unmute yourselves now. I don't know if I had that clicked. 
And if you have to head into another meeting, that's totally understandable as well. And I believe we recorded this. So I, I'm hoping that we're gonna take it and take the recording and send it out to everybody. I just have to double check with awesome, make sure that's okay um, and that that's all right with everybody. And I really appreciate you all coming. And um, I, you can reach me at either at Teach Watts, oops, I better, there we go, at Teach Watts on Twitter, or I'll give you my email. Um, if you um, want to connect at any point in the future, um, and I'm happy to help you. If you're going to run a, a virtual learning event of some sort and you want some help or advice or just someone to take a look at anything, I'm happy to help you because um, we're all just trying to figure this new normal out together and I have a feeling we're in this for maybe a little bit longer. Great to see so many of you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dana. Great seeing thank you. you. Thank Great you. Great to see you. Information. Great. Thank you. Very helpful. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Dana. I was talking. We were chatting on uh, Slack actually, just because you could see that we probably had like I think six people from Cotopaxi. Oh, awesome. Um, I was like, Dana Watts is amazing. Like, you should research, read her dissertation. Like, it's. <laughs> well, you know how your dissertation is only read by your supervisor and your parents. So now Todd's dispersed it to everybody. <laughs> yes. Well, so that's the thing is like, I'll, so I was lucky enough to honestly like be there while Dana was writing this dissertation and practicing on all of us. Like, it was perfect. You know what? It's a really long dissertation. I think it's <laughs> they always are. To read that. <laughs> uh, thank you, Dana. Actually, it's really it was wonderful to go. Hey, we're doing some things right, you know, because a lot of days you feel like you're just making it up. So, um, thank you for that. I feel like a lot of us are kind of making it up, but as we make it up, some some of the things are working and some of the yeah. things aren't. But we've got to help each other so that we're stronger, yeah. especially for our students. Like they're sitting there and they're, they're seeing. We, I, I honestly wish we could get more students involved with developing some of this because they're seeing what's working in one class and then what's not working in other classes and have them help us create some of these things. Well, and also there's this thing of like repetition, although a teacher might go, I've got a Kahoot and then we do this and then when they fill in a dock and then, it, but that's that teacher's perspective. But from the kid's perspective, they're doing that five times during the day, the same thing over and over again. And even though that thing is happening within that class and you feel good about your practice from the kid's perspective, they're going, oh my God, here we go again. And I'm going to do all of this again. So the novelty, not only within the class, but the novelty across the division is really important as well, I think, for kids. Um, I remember when Prezi presentations first came out yeah. and I went to a back to school night and every teacher gave me a Prezi and I was my, I had a headache and I was like, I've been zipping around way too many presentations. And I had kids all in high school at that point. So eight Prezi's in a row. I was like, oh my gosh, you need some diverse, some, a little bit of changing it up a little bit. So yeah, actually the communication between teachers for a grade level cohort, I think is, is really important. And I think that's something we, we're gonna have to work on this semester. Yeah. And also, uh, and also Dana, thank, I, I appreciate your workshops too and like sessions because like you do add this like le level of like vulnerability um, that makes it so much more human. And like, on, I think that it puts so many people at ease. And I think that that's, that's a good example for us to be like, tech doesn't work all the time. We're human. We can make mistakes. We move on. Like, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. I just want to say that everybody here is Cotopaxi right now. Yeah. <laughs> One of the funny, so instead of sharing my wine story, what I should have shared, but a more appropriate professional one might have been I was sitting in my chair, actually the chair over there, and it literally is so old and beat up, it collapsed. So I'm sitting there like presenting and I went, boom, like what? <laughs> right in my butt and I'm like oh my god I'm sitting there still trying to present and talk and I'm on the floor and I was like it might be time for a new chair 
Now, I do like the licking the cup, though, as if everything in there is coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, Chanda, I think it was last week when you and I were meeting. I can't remember. It was like late in the day. And I just saw Chanda open, crack a, I think it was like a Heineken or something. And like just. Oh, sort of please. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to go to a senior leadership meeting. So I have a question. Nice you, <laughs> I'll see you a little bit, Chanda. Nice you too. Okay. Yeah, what's up, Wendy? Anna, how might I get access to those beautiful Padlets that you've created with ISS? Ooh, here, uh, let me see. I think I might even have them up on my, um, will you send me, how about this? Uh, will you send me, will you put your email in the chat and I'll send you a link to all of them and you can share them with everyone in your school. Wonderful. Cause I have one for every subject area. And it's funny, I've been thinking about how to best, um, how to best collect resources like that. And, and that's a, I don't, I don't know why I never thought about that. I have various versions of Google Docs and stuff like that, but I like the collaborative nature of those. So Dana, Wendy is our new uh, STEAM specialist at Cotopaxi. And so she's part of this oh, group. Awesome. Mm -hmm. so and I love Laura Benson. If you get, um, imagine you get to work with Laura Benson quite a bit. I was at an ISS school prior to this and my husband and I named her milk and cookies because she yeah. is like, yeah, yeah. So the kindest, sweetest, most generous person. But, and, but just such a gentle way to nudge you. Like you go in, she meets you where you are, all affirmation. And then this little and you're like, I can do it. I can do it. And so I was super fortunate to do quite a bit of PD with her over the years. So, yeah. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Wendy, Dana is a, like, so Dana, and I, I think I put this in the Slack of like, Dana has such a, like a, a amazing background because she was a tech, uh, you were a tech specialist. Was it India? India. And then you came to, I uh, know you came to HKS as a tech specialist. Yep. Um, but so her dissertation is in pro professional development, but like she's been everything and has a great resource. So uh, if you follow her on, on you, you're active on Twitter. What about W lead? Are you still able, are you still keeping up with that? I am, but not as much because so all the work with W lead that I was doing, which I still am super passionate about encouraging more women to go into leadership, but I kind of started to move more into the diversity collaborative because I realized it's not just women and we just need more equity within all leadership. Our leadership has to start looking like our student body and it doesn't. And um, and so I really just want to try to help. And it was, so anyway, I've gotten more involved with that because our, our students need to see themselves in our leadership in, in gender and race and religion and every aspect. And it's frustrating to me. So I've been put, focusing a little bit more of my energy there on the ISA, ISS diversity? Okay. Well, the diversity collaborative is all, it's anyone can join and it's all schools, but ISS, we like, we just take care of all the resources and I've been doing, I've been doing a lot of the research. And so I work with the data and crunch numbers and from our surveys to try to fit. And then I try to make all the data look pretty. So people actually read it because no one really <laughs> wants to read a 300 page dissertation, but I can make pretty little groovy graphics. <laughs> And so to showcase the lack of diversity in our schools. <laughs> so truth. All right. I got to run to Dana. It's good to see you. I hope oh, you so good. great to see you. Okay, Wendy, I'll send you all those resources. Much appreciated. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.